Excellent. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends and enemies. Um, this is the Forensic Focus podcast. Uh, Desi and I are here at opposite ends of the time zones. Uh, it's not really early morning for me. It's 8.30. Um, and it's not really late night for him because it's... It's only 6.40 for me. Oh, my God. 6.40. Yeah. That's reasonable. Yeah. Um, but he's been skiving off all day, so it doesn't really matter anyway. <laughs> um <laughs> So yeah, so um, as is as is the way of these things, we start off uh, off air. Although I, I'm starting to think we should just hit record when we join, and then they, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll cut it later and, and and leave these things. We we were we were discussing um, some stuff that we've came across uh, on the back of, of last week, and uh, Desi's put two papers forward, uh, both from DFRWS, um, the US one. Yes, DFRWS USA. Yeah. 22 and 2019, uh, the CSAM one, uh, as you were saying, um, both from the FRWS to do with the use of um, or the relevance of machine learning and artificial artificial intelligence. I hate that term so much uh, in forensics and, uh, and various things. And obviously, we'll link to those in the show notes. Um, but we'll start with the older paper. Um, and we were just discussing, so the, the paper is about um, a practitioner survey exploring the value of forensic tools, AI, filtering, and safer presentation for investigating uh, child sexual abuse material, CSAM stuff. Um, and it's a paper, we'll put the links in, by Laura Sanchez, Cynthia, I'm so sorry, people, I'm going to get this totally wrong. I can do Corey Hall, that one's easy. Uh, Ibrahim Bagili and Cynthia Grajeda. There's probably a better pronunciation of that J in whatever the, uh, the the original language that it originates from is, but I'm, I do apologise. Um, so the uh, we, we were we were just flicking through it now. I think Desi's read a wee bit more of it than I have. But we were the the question that came up from it is: Is AI just an automation tool? Um, and I think I think I think you've actually hit the nail on the head there. It, it, it has to be at this point in time, otherwise we're allowing we're allowing for um, a machine to make intelligent decisions. Now AI is such a false term, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we're talking about statistical analysis here. That's all it is: is statistical analysis. Uh, machine mm. learning is statistical analysis, um, either in a constructive way if you're talking about something like a deep fake, or in a in a reductive way if you're talking about looking at something and saying, "Is this uh, child pornography or is it not?" Mm. Um, sorry, again, I I'll, let's let me rephrase that. Um, I got into the industry too long ago, and the phrase "child pornography" is a uh, a term that was used at back back in the day. It's not. Pornography is something that consenting adults can agree to. This is child sexual abuse material, and hence the fact that we call it CSAM. Um, and uh, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be related to pornography, which is perfectly legal and is entitled uh, for, for people to create and, and distribute and enjoy as they wish. So CSAM, and we'll keep referring to that. It's in, in the UK, it's IIOC, Indecent Images of Children. Uh, in, mm -hmm. in the rest of the world, okay. it's CSAM. So. Um, so we can we can um, pick, pick an acronym and we'll stick with it. We'll call it CSAM. Mm. But at the end of the day, you're going to to identify a piece of CSAM and present. It has to be presented to an examiner for confirmation. You can't have a machine deciding that uh, this image is CSAM and attempting to to guess the age and attempting to um, classify it in terms of its severity. Okay, so there are there are different levels of severity if you want to know about them look them up i'm not i'm not going to go into that here it's unpleasant enough as is um so ai can assist um that machine learning can assist but i wonder actually if perhaps there's not a risk certainly in terms of categorization and age estimation if there's the kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you put a number and a category in front of an examiner and they're borderline on it, they will err towards going with what the 
software tells them it is. Now, yeah. that could be a good thing. It, it, could, it could be that the software is reasonably accurate. It could be that it's downgrading it, or it could be that it's upgrading it, all of which are, you know, either an upgrade or a downgrade is a bad thing, either from the perspective of, well, both from the perspective of justice being done, but in favour of either uh, the defence or the prosecution. And um, so, it, so in that regard, it has to be an automation tool. It can't be allowed to make decisions and actually it has to be relatively restricted in what it can be allowed to say perhaps you know things like age categorization and 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 um and severity um both of which are, are hard jobs and and you know i i do see some cases i have in fact i've got one this week i need to to go through um but i at the beginning of, of my report, it says, I am not an expert in classification. I will not um, take a stab at figuring out how old somebody is, and I will not figure out what the category is. I mean, the category categorization is, is relatively easy to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, that's not my, my place to do it. I'm a digital expert. I know what a computer is. I know what a file is, and I know where it's been and what where it's come from when it was created. But I couldn't tell you that you know, somebody in it is 15 or 25. Um, I mean, I might be able to manage 15 or 75, but that's that's a pretty broad guess. Um, and, you know, the, the, there are specialists and there are medical professionals who have a far better understanding of, of child development and, and um, you know, the way that people grow and change over time I mean, that, that, you know, are way beyond my my knowledge and therefore it's not something that, that i would want the idea that the machine can do that i mean logically yes if you you can distill a hell of a lot of knowledge into a, a, a machine learning environment by showing it images and and saying you know this and and machine learning has been very interesting actually there's a, there was an article yesterday and I'll, I'll i'll link to it um and in fact i'll bring it up and i'll see it. i'll find it first then i'll bring it up on the screen um, they were using it for developing antibiotics. Um, hang on, let's have a look and see if I can remember what the article was. AI. But I think that's that's just it. Like you, we started talking about AI, and then you mentioned like you can get a lot of benefit out of automating with um, machine learning, and that's just it. Like that that was the article, and that's what sparked my question. Is when I read the artificial intelligence section on the, the CSEM article, it talks about machine learning to start with uh, and then talks about training a network and then just using it as, as an automation tool. So um, it's like, it seems like such an abused term within the research community to say something's AI when, when it's not. Like it is just machine learning and, and tool automation and, and humans yeah. are just training computers to to think in quotes on how to do things. Um, and then I guess to your point about like the, like training it to do the age estimations, um, I do know, and I, I don't know whether it's gotten better, but I remember reading a paper where um, it was good for, uh, but it was good for um, like a, a Caucasian data set but if it was any other ethnicity, uh, it was really poor at telling um, kind of like traits and age and and even gender sometimes. It was really bad at, at distinguishing between it because I guess like it wasn't trained on that data set. Um, and that could potentially be a, an issue, particularly in the CSEM space. Like if you've got ethnically diverse uh, children who are being abused, um, is potentially that set missing something because like i don't know how how lea uses it like whether every time uh they're manually going in and checking or there's some cases where maybe data sets are just being used uh because they're trying to protect people from i guess the psychological impact that that has uh on the analysts yeah, yeah. i mean i think i, I think because we it, it's difficult. It's difficult. I mean, and, and yes, we want to prevent psychological dam damage on the analyst. But at the end of the day, 
we're professionals. We don't roll out. Well, I think we probably would if we could, but we don't roll out, you know, automated um, doctors to because we're worried about the impact that you know seeing some blood is having on a doctor. You know, A and E medics are you know immensely stressed. They're immensely uh, under the cosh, and, and arguably there's a lot more pressure. I mean, we're, we're there's, there's a huge backlog of cases in the UK in terms of. Um, uh, forensics, but um, you know, ultimately, we could do with far more doctors than we could with forensic analysts, they're kind of more important, um, I would argue. Uh, and I say that as a forensic analyst, we're trying, are we, are we trying to absolve ourselves of responsibility in, in the interests of our our better health. I don't know. We we take on these roles because we think it's important to do and because it's important that it's done right. And although there are things that, you know, can make this life easier. I, I one of one of the best things is large, large hash data sets of um CSAM that exist so that we can do a, a match against yeah. um known CSAM. Yeah. That's out there and, and that that already, I mean that's that's fantastic. And to be honest um, in, in certain cases, that would be enough to get a conviction. That's fine. You know, nobody needs to look at it. You've got an ID, you've got a, 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 a an image which we know the origin of by now. We actually, you know, that that child has been secured and yeah. protected, and is 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 is, is hopefully getting on and, and having a, a a new life. Um, and that is is properly categorized because we know the age at that point in time we know the offense and therefore mm. that's enough to secure a conviction the fact is is that anything that is new needs to be looked at by a human at some point because we need to start yeah. to do the child protection aspects of it yeah um so it's sooner or later somebody is going to have to deal with it um and that should be you know it'd be in the social services sphere and, and like that um we can do our best. I think perhaps the the you know looking at the article, what it perhaps is suggesting that it might be able to do is, to a certain extent, extract things for some parties that are less um, in, uh, damaging, uh, in the sense that you know you could just do face extraction, for example. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, um, and then you could be using that in child protection. Okay, you know, you know, identifying mm. people, um, and that's that's that has a value, um, especially whereby you're not necessarily presenting it directly as evidence. Evidence, you know, ev evidential value has to be high. You know, this has to be the truth. You know, you can't take an mm. interpreted, uh, a, an interpreted and upscaled image and, and then pass it off as being entirely accurate. Whereas if you take a uh, an interpreted and upscaled image. Um, in order to identify someone, you can then cross-check that by going and talking to them and saying, "Is this you?" Mm. kind of thing. So you know, there, there are there are methodologies, and um, there is definitely some value. Mm. But for evidential stuff and and to 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 look at it, and and again, the trouble is, is that if you say you kind of have to watch the whole movie or the whole, if it's if it's a a video file, you have to watch the whole thing for. Uh, for its content, because at the beginning it may well be one thing, and at the end it may well be another. And you know, how does one interpret if if a machine learning? And this is a problem with statistics, actually. Well, not the problem necessarily; it's just the nature of statistics. Is that if you have, let's say, a video that is um, the first twenty minutes of it are perfectly fine, and the last one minute isn't. Statistically, that may well not flag as a um, a, a CSAM, even though mm. at the end of it, it is. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know any manufacturers who are doing this. I think, I think the where I first sort of came across it was the idea that a simple statistical analysis to identify images that had a large content of skin tone, for example, is generally indicative of either photographs of a beach or something that is potentially 
uh, something that you want to flag for, for further, you know, further examination. Yeah, true. So may, maybe in like, if you had a, a full set of photographs and you identified manually one that was CSAM already, then you could mm. parse that full set through to get a broader understanding of how many of those photos were potentially CSAM from that from that set. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think c coming back to your, your original question, which was, is it an automation tool? I think the answer is yes, with caveats, in the same way that a triage tool is yes, it's a tool with caveats, which is it does, a triage by definition doesn't look at everything. And I think in a similar way, I, artificial intelligence or machine learning is a tool, but it doesn't look at everything. And whether it actually looks at every bit of data or not is you know that's open to debate but what it doesn't do is it doesn't look at it with an interpretive eye it looks at it with a statistical yeah. eye yeah yeah um, there's and no therefore it's, it... there's no like objective thought behind um there's no objective thought behind the the process itself like it's not making decisions it's not making like as an investigator, you may look at a file in a folder and go, I've seen this before, or I know the TTP of this attacker, so I'm just going to jump over here and look somewhere else. Like, to me, like those investigative leaps where you're associating something that's not directly involved is mm. a hallmark of, I guess, investigation intelligence, right? So, yeah. and I haven't, I haven't seen a tool that does that yet. Like it, if you tell it to go look at these places, it will. But if there was something new that was not really associated, like it's not going to make that jump and, and go and find that. I'm trying to remember who it was that was telling me this, but somebody somebody was talking I, about I, you. So I, I was just thinking about it because I heard it was on um, Triple J, I think, which is our like national broadcast, one of our national um, radio stations. And they have a segment... Uh, I think every week with Dr. Carl, who was like a really prominent scientist, um, but they had a guest on and I'll have to figure out where, it, where it was and link it, but they were talking about, um, it was pretty much like an entire episode on chat GPT and they were talking All about right. it and, and like they want to see whether chat GPT will eventually make investigative leaps. Like if you told it to go figure something out, it would make a jump between like a pivot that wouldn't necessarily be straightforward, but a human would do, um, is kind of where they want yeah. to see if they can get chat, chat GPT to go next, which I, I thought was interesting, um, which would be a good step, right? Like it'd be um, like the start to AI, I guess, because that's what sparked me reading this paper and, and looking at it was I don't think AI is like the way it's defined. I don't think it's real when everyone uses it as AI. Like it's just machine learning and automation. It's it's, it's interesting because I mean I I you know <laughs> confession time I actually read artificial intelligence at university um, a, a long time ago. I, I went to Edinburgh, um, and I studied under uh, several people. One guy was a guy called Chris Mellish, who uh, who was the guy who invented Prolog as a programming language for for AI stuff. He was my tutor, um, and AI is the field of trying to make computers do this. Mm. And as of yet, we haven't succeeded. Yeah. So to label anything as AI is a complete lie. There, there yeah. is no AI. There is machine learning. There is uh, the applied statistics, which it is, which, you know, let's let's be honest, you know, things that we've shown last week uh, or the week before last um, are absolutely impressive there's no two ways about it you know the fact that you can create an image that is nigh on photorealistic um and you can you can have i mean i've got a chat gbt open in the window here i've got it had it writing haikus and it writes haikus way better than i do because it can remember what the structure is supposed to be for a start yeah and you know it, it's incredible it's amazing but it's not intelligent and the amount of people that are using it as a sales pitch and misusing it as a label is uh is astronomical and it's not, yeah. it's not right in my opinion um 
but it, that with that comes this massive risk that people will believe that it is capable of something amazing, and it isn't. Um, it is it, to a certain extent. It's kind of like the um, the early conversations about the cloud. It's like the cloud will be the solution to all of our IT problems. No. <laughs> the cloud moves your IT problems from one place to another potentially, but it's yeah. not a, it's not it's not this panacea of uh, of amazing uh, thing. And AI is that as well. It's not it's not a panacea. It's a tool at the moment. Um and I think we should actually, you know, being w- without being too skynetty about it and and uh uh, and paranoid and dystopian, we should actually be slightly worried if we start to create computers that can make decisions and can think for themselves. Um, you know, Asimov's three laws of robotics are very important. And, you know, I wonder how the... My experience of the general literacy of the population is is sadly disappointing. Um but you know things we we need we we need people to be reading things if they're not banned in the US things like 1984 and um you know Asimov for the three laws of robotics and Brave New World and um if nothing else the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to see what happens to a to, to Marvin the paranoid android when he 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 attains consciousness and then realizes that everything is hopeless and just doesn't want to do anything um you know <laughs> We we should be very careful about selling uh, selling this as a panacea without you know the true uh, true appreciation of potentially the well we're in we're we're concerned about atomic weapons now. You wait until we create a, a machine that can think for itself. I mean you know that's that's going to be scary. Um, but yeah, it, it it does it does to me seem to be very disingenuous that people are saying that their product has this instead of saying that our product does some very clever statistical analysis, which, you know, certainly in our field is definitely understood and definitely appreciated. I'd much rather somebody said, look, you know, we do a really detailed statistical analysis and um, and I'm going to call Amped out on this because I've, I've found their products to be very good and then explain what it is that that statistical analysis has done. And then when they finish doing it, give you the results in the mathematical way that shows how they got to the answer. Yeah. Um, if you do that, it's science, not snake oil. And that's cool. <laughs> I was <laughs> I was just going to say that. Like, I'm, I'm immediately skeptical whenever, like, someone reaches out on LinkedIn or, like, you go to a conference and you see all the vendors there and as part of their advertising, it's like, we use AI to, to model things. And then it's when you talk to the vendor or, or um, like reply to whoever back, you're like, so what is the AI doing? And usually like they don't know, like they're just salespeople or, or pre-sales. They're, they're generally not the engineers behind it and, and marketing's probably put it together and they're like, oh, AI is cool. Like let's just say that it's that it's AI. Mm-hmm. But it means like in my mind, and, and I'm sure it happens to a lot of people that are in the industry, it immediately discredits that that vendor or or that person that that's reaching out or that brand because saying ai and then not being able to like fair enough like things are secret and you don't want to tell people how you do things and and because that's how you get a market edge that's fine but you should be able to explain in some way on how ai is helping or like you said like ant provides the the kind of mathematical how he got here because you probably have to use that, right? But well, this is it. Is is that certainly in our field? I, I I get that there needs to be some commercial sensitivity, but the bottom line is is that your product does something. Somebody needs to stand up in court and say what the hell has happened and how it got to these conclusions. Either it's going to be I have to put in a call to your guys to come to court to explain, which may be your business model, and you want to claim costs for that. Yeah. Although I suspect it's not going to scale well. Or mm. I have to understand how it does it so that I can explain something which is a proprietary secret that is kept back and um, not disclosed is difficult. 
and and you know, I, I, I'll, I'll sort of allude to something similar in the UK. We there, there's been a, a very large set of cases around something called Encro phones uh, and Encro Chat, which yeah. was an encrypted telephone network. You've probably heard of it. We've talked about it before, I think. But the bottom line is, is that from a defense perspective, we can just simply say we cannot confirm or refute the the accuracy of this information because you haven't told us how you've acquired it. You've mm. given this a high-level, wishy-washy explanation of what's happened, but we have no raw data to examine. With the, the methodology with which it's been achieved is obtuse. Um, there's no code to examine. We can't you know, test the tools to verify that they do it accurately. We can't. Mm. So, so all of the steps that we would normally be able to 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 carry out uh, are hidden in the midst of official secrecy things yeah. for various countries, um, and that doesn't actually really make for a fair trial. Now, I think in a lot of cases in, in <laughs> that I've seen that have gone through with the Encro phone, it really doesn't help that people have taken photos of large wads of cash in the middle of their living room along with a pile of drugs and then taken a few photos of their car sent them to their mates and then talked about their kid getting sick at school on the day they went to pick them up you can see the, you know the police have been able to abstract the intelligence from the content once yeah. the tool has been discredited so they're safe on that grounds um and ultimately i guess that's what we would have to say from the um from the AIs is that if you can then extract the evidence from it by, you know, passing it to a human that can then confirm or refute, um, perhaps it has a value, but you know, it's a, it's a slippery slope, isn't it? To have a, a black box that spits out answers. Um, and you don't yeah. know whether it's spitting out the right ones, the wrong ones, half of them, what, what the actual, so, actual result is. I, I have a, a story about that um, before we'll, we'll probably jump across to your topic on the article that you sent me. So I yeah. would love to talk about that on, on tonight's show. Um, but it was back in 20, 2017. Um, we'd been where I was working for, we'd been approached by a vendor, um, very well known, like is used in a lot of court cases. And one of their solutions uh, engineers had come out to try and get us to, to purchase it, to use it in, in our job. Um, cause we did do data collection and a little bit of forensics and I was having a chat to the solutions engineer about how, how the program collects or how, how their devices collected data and then processed it because like I, I'd used their, their stuff before, but I was like, okay, so it collects the data. It should be in a raw format at least so it hashes it first before ingesting it into the tool because it, it had its own proprietary like format system like a lot of the big ones do. Yeah. And he was like, no, like we just, we, we put it in our format and then we hash it. And I was just like, okay, well, cool. You've got your format. That's fine. Like there's probably open source tools that parse it and, the, and they do. But how do you hash it? Like once it's in your program and they had a proprietary hash and I was like, well, how do you, how do you confirm that? Like, sure. If you've got a proprietary, why don't you also do a SHA-256 so that if I want to do my own forensics with other tools, I can compare it to the output that the tool is giving me versus like, how do I know your tool's not doing anything with that data? And they're like, no, no, it's fine. Like we're approved by courts and like a lot of people use this and I'm like, cool, but I don't trust you. Like, how do I know you don't have a rogue engineer at one point? Or how do I know your tool doesn't break and does something weird with the data and it's not presenting it correctly and I need to verify? And it, it just like, I could see the thought going in, but I don't think he'd ever worked in a forensic, like where yeah. forensics was, he needed to follow a chain of custody and verify data. Like they'd just been building tools this whole time and they're like, no, nah, nah, we've got this. And I'm like, it's trust but verify yeah. all the time. Like, yeah, the the I, I remember. I, so you know, I worked in security, and we we looked at sort of crypt cryptography as a big a big aspects of security work. And uh, you know, you bounce around it in long enough, and it's like you know, what's the best advice for writing 
your own cryptographic uh, libraries, your best cryptographic protocols. And the best advice is don't. Yeah. Fundamentally, you know, yeah. there are known, good, solid, tried and tested cryptographic protocols. And the same yeah. for the hashes. If somebody said that they had created their own proprietary hash, my first reaction would be no, just no, absolutely not. Because unless yep. it's been tried and tested, how do I know about collisions? How do I know about that that space that it's in? It's it's a you ridiculous about, proposition. How do you know about vulnerabilities? Like, yeah, depending on what you're using your cryptograph for. Like, if you're using it to secure something, like, there's probably someone smarter than you that can find a vulnerability in that. Yeah, and that's why the the. Uh, the, the tried and tested ones are so good is because a whole bunch of people smarter than me have been involved in doing it and yeah. i've got a lot of faith and even then you know you see you see you know md5 was kicking around for for years and years um and, and you know to be fair md5 is still it's still not a bad hash as it goes you know in terms of realistic real world attack it's incredibly challenging yeah. it's not impossible and that's why we've moved on to Shah. It's not impossible. It's it's doable. It's logically and feasibly mm. achievable. But you know, could the man on the street do it? No. And therefore, you know, the chances of <laughs> the the hash that I've collected today on MD five and the hash that I collect tomorrow on MD five from the same disc, yeah. if they match, am I worried about that disc having changed? No, I'm not. Yeah. Um, and it's quicker than Shah two fifty six. Um, but you know, realistically, but you know, for for purposes outside of that, for things on the web. Um, if I'm downloading and verifying a package, no, I'm going to be using a cryptographic protocol that I've got more faith in that has has a, a higher security. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so yeah, so yeah, no, I, that that's bad. The the, the story I I was hearing the other day was um, I think I know who it was. Now we'll we'll we're going to talk to them later, and I'll I'll try and get them to to reiterate it. They probably won't because it may be confidential. He says, thinking very carefully about what he could say. Um, but, you know, somebody came to them to ask them to test the tool in order for validation purposes. It was a forensic tool. Yeah. And then they were talking about uh, where... So it's, it's it's looking for certain evidence, This whatever this forensic tool is. And it's it has certain expected places, and it has other places in the file system where it wasn't expecting to find evidence. And they were like, right, so you're going to put the evidence in the places we expect to find it. You're like, no. I mean, <laughs> sorry, you want me to set up the test so that your tool passes it, uh, and then yeah. that's going to get you your validation? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, so, so I don't know what the outcome of that was, but but yeah, that, that sort of similar similar vein. Probably them finding someone else to test the, and validate who would put yeah. the evidence in the uh, yeah. in the right spots. So, I guess this is. Yeah. It. Again, it's it's why you should always question the tools that you're using, even like in the example that I give. And, and I'm not going to name and shame because they may have changed since mm -hmm. 2017 when I was looking at them. Um, but even well-known tools, like it, it's still worth questioning how they how they function, what you're getting out of it, and and always test and verify uh, with at least one other tool. And and every forensics course i've ever done always says that like yeah. don't trust one tool because it may it may be interpreting things differently or it may be incorrect and you see that with vendors that do come out and publish changes to their tools that say hey between these these dates with this patch this information was wrong um so if you had had cases go back and if it was critical go back and have a look at at your data set yeah yeah, yeah. There, there have been several um, fairly high high profile uh things of that nature yeah absolutely mm. um, all right trust but verify good, good okay chat, good chat about ai but you sent me a a news article which was pretty interesting i had to read this afternoon uh where a, a 32 year old man um has appeared in court charged with murder of was it was it his partner or just he just murdered i do you know i was reading the article as well and i couldn't see it now the the name is different. I, I don't know if they what their the state of their relationship was, and I haven't read a, read enough around it to to be able to comment sensibly. Um, but it's essentially the guy had provided an alibi to the police that uh, he was 
uh, online at the time, live streaming uh, a playthrough of a game. And um, it turns out that said live stream was pre-recorded. Oh, he, he said he said to the people in the chat of the live stream that he was having some technical difficulties and therefore he couldn't respond to chats in real time um, and thus got around the little uh, niggle of having to respond to people talking to him in real time. Um, he said that at the beginning of the live stream, did his pre-recorded live stream and played it back at the time this murder was committed. Um, giving himself what appeared to be quite a, a good alibi. Um, turns out that not only has he now subsequently admitted that you know it was a pre-recorded live stream, but that somebody uh, somehow figured that out. Um, whether it was a, a forensics examination of his device, um, or whether it was a forensic examination of the video. I, I have yet to find out, but it's a really exciting concept. And it's quite funny because um, I saw this a few days ago and I, I, it, it passed my mind and I thought, oh, that's interesting. Um, uh, and then it slipped, slipped my mind. But before I sent it to you, uh, there's a program here on the BBC called Death in Paradise. Okay, It's a uh, detective series, it's essentially uh, predicated on the concept of what's called a rocked, locked room uh, mystery whereby basically there are a number of suspects um, but none of them technically could have committed the crime because they were all busy being somewhere else or the room was locked and there was nowhere they could have gotten into it and all the windows were shut and that kind of you know yeah. how how did they do it kind of thing and last night's episode without wanting to spoil spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it yet who might want to watch um part of this um, this guy's alibi is that he is on a live stream Q and A about his his work, his book. He's a criminologist. Um, at the time that the murder would have had to be committed, and it it sprung it sprung it in my mind. And I, I was saying to, to the family who were watching with me, I was like, "Oh, that's really interesting because there's a case that's just been been done on that." Now it turns out that actually he was live streaming it. He was just live streaming it from another location at the time, that had been made to look like his original location, where he claimed to have been live-streaming it from. So it was a bit of subterfuge in that regard, rather than the pre-recorded live-stream. Um, but I, I did... It, it, it jogged it in my memory, and that's why I, I sort of sent it over to you as, a, as an interesting uh, as an interesting concept. Um, yeah. But it's, it's... The amount of times, actually, now that... I mean, I've done cases where people have tried to use digital evidence as an alibi. I, I can remember, it happens often with phones. People are like, you know, I, I was somewhere else. Here's my GPS data. You know, you can see that, you know, please pull the cell site. I was 15 miles away at the time taking a phone call from a granny. You know, can you can you cross-reference that and show that I was somewhere else? Which is the device was 15 miles away at that point in time. Mm. <laughs> I have no idea where you were. Um, although somebody unlocked it and, you know, that kind of thing. I've had someone come to me, although I, I didn't do the case, but somebody came and said, look, I was busy playing FIFA on my PlayStation at the time this happened. Could you please show that I was logged in? And again, it was like, well, yeah, we can show that somebody perhaps was playing FIFA using your account, but I can't prove it was you. Um, although it's an interesting question that, you know, one must have a certain playing style. Um, that is detectable through a controller if you were to do an, enough analysis of it so that, that it would be able to tell you can I know you can do it with typing um back in the day I remember some some programs that could identify who was sat at the keyboard on the basis of the typing cadence um, because everybody types differently in the same way as we have different handwriting we have different typing styles and different hands on on keyboards although I change keyboards so often I suspect that it's um it is hugely dependent upon device being used and thus um, it confuses things. Back in the day of corporate environments where everybody had exactly the same keyboard, maybe it was a more effective thing. So I assume you could do similar things with a with a PlayStation and a, and a controller and, and pick up a sort of playing style. Mine is just terrible. Um, so, so yeah. So it's not it's not not unusual to come across the the idea of alibi verification i remember I, I, one case i did do was 
actually i strangely i thoroughly enjoyed doing was was a guy had been accused of um domestic violence or domestic assault um and he had provided a, an internal CCTV camera of his lounge of him at home for the whole evening. Okay. Um, and it had been uploaded to the cloud. So we knew that the timestamps were pretty accurate in so much as they hadn't been tampered with um, for him to, to do it. So we knew that the time was okay. We I watched this. So I got something like, 10 hours of footage of this guy from from whatever time at night but he slept with the television on and you could see the tv in the screen in the cctv capture and i could track through all of the programs that he was watching or that were coming onto the television at the various points in time during the night um i could cross-reference them with the uh radio times uh listings for the day so the radio times is a, a magazine in the uk which says what programs show when and there's archived copies so i could cross-reference all of the television programs going on um you know i could see that he was there the whole time he got up and went to the loo in the middle of the night and then went back to bed and you could see and, and unfortunately hear uh, that process going on through these cctv speakers so so you know this kind of alibi building is 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 a strong thing and um i i'm just intrigued like you you know how did they they manage to pull this one out and uh, and identify oh, it? it's fascinating yeah so it's it's interesting that it doesn't seem like there's too much information and and while you were telling that story i i read a few more articles and they all say the same thing so um all it says is that police determined that it was fake but then halfway down each one it says that uh he then admitted to to faking that stream. So it, it's kind of the question of was it just a hunch and they provided enough pressure to with other evidence for him to admit it or did someone actually do forensics on it? And, and is like it would be interesting to know what the forensic was to determine that it was was fake um, or, or how he even was planning on doing it like – I imagine if it was pre-recorded and uploaded, there would be evidence on the stream because it was on YouTube. There would be evidence on YouTube yeah. servers to to say, well, potentially. I don't know. Like it it's, could be steady so, code. There's nothing there. So, yeah. So the article I have says uh, DCI Neil McGuinness said technical examination by cyber experts indicated the footage was pre-recorded. So that does kind of imply that. Um. That it was a, a an examination of of some form that did it. Whether it was, but but still, I don't know whether that examination was of. I mean, you know, if he pulled his laptop, if they pulled his laptop and examined it and found the pre recorded stream, great. I mean, that's really easy. The question is, is you know, if they pulled it from from YouTube, then what was the giveaway? What was the thing that that showed it to yeah. be to be false? Um, yeah, you're right. Because if they if they found that the the time created timestamp was before when the live stream was then that makes sense because the timestamp yeah. would have been like these ones that we do, like the timestamp for the full recording will be after we finish this session because it down like it uploads everything yeah. and then you can download it and the timestamp would be different on our computers. But yeah, I I just have a feeling like reading the article, uh, it, seem, it seems really cool the way they wrote it, but then I'm just like, they probably just did get his laptop and and look at a timestamp and they're just like our cyber experts figured this out and and like good on them like they probably had a hunch and went and got a warrant and they're like we don't reckon this is oh yeah i mean whatever life. the 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 net result is i mean the the, the thing is is like another quote from the prosecution here is is that the suspect had devised a sophisticated calculated and cool-headed plot and was capable of deception beyond imagination quite a i think well like I think that's that's actually true. Like it's a pretty interesting way to provide an alibi because it, it it seemed like he was a pretty popular YouTuber. Um, so it seemed like a pretty interesting way to create an alibi for yourself in a non traditional sense. Yeah, yeah, and and you know it's quite it's something that you tend to think of 
as requiring your presence and you have a lot of people being a witness i mean it is yeah. it is almost television oh, it is television plot worthy you see you, you know <laughs> literally just describe the plot um so so yeah it, it's definitely definitely i mean you're not going to argue that this was a crime of passion and not premeditated are you this is yeah you know, it's going to be a difficult one i mean um, if this although i will say so he he was um faked Grand Theft Auto live stream, and if this was in America, which this wasn't in America, it was the UK, I think. It was Ireland, Northern Ireland. Oh, so yes, okay. UK technically. If this yes. if this was in America, Congress would be talking about how violent video games are, are causing people <laughs> to premeditate YouTube streams and kill people, um, and they'd be trying to ban a whole bunch at the moment. So, a, a total digression. Do you think that 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 there is any link between violent video no. games and? Uh... No. no, I think I think people probably have a predisposition to violence, and if they're presented with violent material, not necessarily video games, then they probably will have a stronger emotional reaction to that, and they may go out and enact that or or premeditate something. But I think it's a I don't think the way they sell it as violent video games causes the general populace to have an increase in violent tendencies, I don't think that's accurate at all. Hmm. I think people are just predisposed. The same same as people are, like some people are predisposed to um, like addictive behavior, behavior for gambling or drugs or alcohol or, yeah, yeah, or anything like that. Like if they're exposed to it, that predisposition may cause an issue for them. But in general, like, Millions of people drink alcohol and, and don't have an issue with it. Yeah. But there will be some that get addicted. I'll tell you, tell you, you know, even huh, my alcohol consumption levels are probably too, or have been too high. I'm not going to, but, it, but it, it's not quite a dependency. Um, but I stopped drinking in January. I'm still not, still not drinking. I, I haven't had a drink since uh, New Year's Eve. Um, but actually, it's not until you stop and decide that you're not going to that you realize how bombarded you actually are with um the concept of drinking yeah it's quite weird to 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 step back and sort of go actually you know what no i i don't need this bottle of wine with my meal deal today i don't need um you know and and just on television everybody is breaking either having a beer or chucking back a whiskey or you know, whatever it is. And it, it, it's like you're sitting there and you think, oh, that'd be nice, but I'm not drinking. But yeah. every, everywhere, everywhere. So when, um, when I was 19, I went uh, backpacking uh, over to, I went to like South Africa and I, and Egypt and Jordan. Um, and it was awesome. And, and when I left, I decided um, that I was going to go vegetarian because um, one, because yeah. Through some of those those regions, like the food quality, especially Egypt, um, dropped quite a bit, and food poisoning is quite common amongst international travel travelers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also decided to stop drinking because I was a student on a very tight budget, and alcohol was just a cost that I I didn't want to wear. Um, but it was so funny when I caught up with people, and they're like, "Oh, let's all have food. And I'm like, yeah, cool. Like I'm, I'm vegetarian. And they're like, yeah, no worries. Like, that's cool. We'll just order a vegetarian dish and like share it and, and all that. But then they're like, Oh, what do you want to drink? And I was like, Oh, I'm not drinking. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Like it's so, <laughs> it's so pervasive in, yeah. in most cultures, um, yeah. like, and not middle East cultures. Cause, uh, generally they don't, well, they're dry countries in general. And most yeah, yeah. people don't drink, um, yeah, just the people I traveled with were like every single night they were like, what's wrong with you? Why don't you just, just have a drink with us? And I'm like, I'm fine. Like yeah. we can chill and just hang out. Like we don't have to, I don't have to get drunk to have a good time. But it, yeah, it's it's funny. And it you're right. Like when you think about just having wine with dinner or, or when you go out with friends, like you go to the pub and it's so common to just get like a pint. Yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah. Um, good place. Speaking, good place to speaking, finish on. Well, I'm gonna say it's a good place to finish on, and yet I still have just a couple more questions that are relevant to to the to the podcast. Yeah. One is, um, Jamie has uh, 
graciously agreed and uh, i will be going to the i oh god he's forgotten what it is um but i will be going to a conference this year uh with forensic focus to go to uh for n for how do you spell forensic for and this is uh, Sai saying that if you're there he may be hitting you up for a conversation this is Sai saying a couple of things yes so event calendar this is much later on in the year than i was going to be I was thinking of going to DFRWS in Bonn, but I will not be doing that now. I will be going to... Uh, where is it? There it is. The European Interdisciplinary Cybersecurity Conference uh, in... Oh, God. Stavanger in Norway. Um, it's 14th, 15th of June this year. Um, and I am thoroughly looking forward to it because I've never been to Norway. Um, so, so that's it. And I know that you spoke to jamie as well have you got that confirmation yet yes so no confirmation yet because australia is is very far away um i'm maybe at a conference in march and we'll talk about that uh, in the next couple of weeks if that goes ahead if not um i'll definitely be around the traps in in australia and new zealand so there's a um a data security conference in uh wellington i believe and then there's the iafs um, where they're presenting the new model for uh, digital forensics as a um, more robust discipline in law enforcement and and courts, um, and that's an international endeavour, and that that'll be in Sydney, so I'll be, I'll be there for that one, and then DFRWS later in the year, plus whatever confer other conferences that are around, um, I'll be at as well. Yeah, I'll be doing the um, the forensic expo in Europe. Uh, in, that's in London, so I have no excuse not to go to that. I did see yeah. another one that was in Birmingham, but then I figured out that it was in Birmingham. Um, wrong on, Birmingham. No, it was wrong Birmingham, Birmingham US. Yeah. yeah, Birmingham, Alabama, which was like, no, I don't <laughs> think I'll be going to that. It was like, oh, Birmingham, that's a couple of hours away, as opposed to, you know, across the Atlantic. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so I'll be doing that. But actually, coming up next, the week after next, um, I'm going to be up in London um and uh, there will be a report on this on forensic focus but the, uh, i'm attending a competition um i'm supporting some students from warwick university who are uh, in the um cyber 912 challenge uh and it's a policy based challenge so basically they've been given a scenario they have to uh evaluate and decide what policy kind of things they're going to implement to try and control the situation as opposed to uh, technical things that they're going to to do. I mean, there are some technical aspects to That's it as well because cool. we've we've got a we've got a real you know real almost a real world vulnerability in um, uh, given to us that's that's based around the Microsoft Exchange vulnerability, um, and so we need to figure out how we're going to manage that and how we're going to manage the wider uh, the wider picture. And um, is that the you know the twenty twenty one vulnerability that kind of like hit everyone? Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a it's a spin off of that. They, 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 it's 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 a fictional scenario. So so essentially, it's yeah. a uh, it, it's it's you know because there's a patch patches out for that. Um, but this is a, a a sort of a step up and and a, a theoretical. So we got a theoretical adversary and um, a, a group of uh, disaffected oligarchs who wish to get their money back, seeing as it's been seized by sanctions. Called New World Order on one side. Um, we've got this vulnerability, and then we've got various things that we need to protect on the other. So we're sort of building this scenario of um, uh, um, policy, uh, policy things, and they're very, uh, very, very talented young young students. And um, nice. I'll, uh, before I name them, I won't, um, but they, I will, I will get them uh, properly in the write up when I have their permission to do it, and that will come up out on Forensic Focus. But it's a really good thing. It's it's open to universities in the UK, and um, I, I thoroughly recommend that anybody who's interested. Uh, in giving their students a slightly different experience in in terms of cyber, um, this is this is a competition to to be involved in. So I'll be up in London. I'll be wandering around the uh, the BT Tower, which is a, an interesting landmark for us in the UK. Yeah, um, and, I think that's um, a it's a really good challenge by the sound of it, though, for a lot of people who want to be in cyber but don't want to be technical as well. Like because that's yeah, a lot yeah, it's a really lot of the important. time, yeah, people ask that question. They're like. I really want to be in cyber and like some of the best incident managers uh, I've ever seen are non-technical. They're just yeah. really good at organization. 
um, like organizing people, organ- organizing technical people, because Cy and I are, are not easily organized. That's for sure. <laughs> I'm not um, easily organized. No. Yeah. Definitely not. You've you've seen our rooms. Like <laughs> we're definitely not organized. So yeah, it's all um, alphabetical order, honestly. <laughs> it's chaotically organized that's how chaotically that's how organized yeah yeah it's the, it's the old adage isn't it it's just like you know if a cluttered mind a cluttered desk is a sign of a cluttered mind what the hell is an empty desk a sign of um yeah. So, yeah before we before we do sign off i will say um if you guys enjoy what we do um please consider liking subscribing um leaving a comment on the platform of your choice that you you listen to or, or view us on um we do check them jamie's really interested in in kind of tracking kind of any kind of feedback that we have um and yeah obviously any of the conferences that that we're at like i i definitely have ran into people already since um since we started so that's that's always funny um especially when people come up to me and they're just like just start talking like they know me and (laughs) which is completely fine like i'm all right but in my mind i'm like I'm stressing so hard because I'm like, have I met this person before? And yeah. should I remember something about them? And then they'll, and then they finish with, oh yeah, that that episode of Forensic Focus podcast. That's what got me thinking about this. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You listen, <laughs> know who I am. You're me, but you, like, I've never met you before. Oh, what um, a relief! Yeah, I'm gonna say I so have. Please, I have yet- please stop freaking me out and start with that that you see me on the podcast. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I've had a few a few people say that they've enjoyed episodes, um, but people I already know who've, who've told me they've enjoyed episodes, but I have yet to to meet someone who, uh, who who's listened, and I I don't know. But I look forward to the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah, if you do, if you if if we are around, uh, you know, please do come up and say hello. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, and and any any feedback is uh, is very welcome. So, uh, so so yeah, please do. Um, and yes, please leave feedback. And and you know, if you have feedback that's not positive um we do want to hear it as well um let us know what you think let us know Uh, and and also any comments you have that relate to the art the 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 things we're talking about um if you um for example work for the northern island police and happen to know what exactly happened in this case and can can uh can enlighten us uh, a bit more as to um as to what what's going on and how this this has panned out, I would be genuinely fascinated to know. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, just so like that, fantastic. Yeah. All right. All right. I think we'll um, we'll leave you there with this week's episode. Um, all the notes will be in the show links like normal, um, and we'll see you guys again soon. Excellent. Fantastic. Take care. See ya.